Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. I am your host, Ashutosh Garg, and today I'm delighted to welcome a very, very, very senior corporate leader and coach and author from India, Mr. Abhijit Bhaduri. Abhijit, welcome to the show. Thank you, Ashutosh. What a privilege it is to be on your show. Thank, Thank you. you for having me. Thank you. Abhijit is the CEO of Abhijit Bhadri and Associates, which is the boutique consulting firm. He's an executive coach. He's earlier spent time with Wipro, Microsoft, Pepsi, and Colgate. And he is one of the most widely followed HR leaders on LinkedIn. He's also an author, and you can see some of his books behind him. So, uh, Abhijit, let's start talking about uh, your journey. Tell me a little bit about how you started and uh, what have been some of your key milestones? Well, I um, grew up, uh, you know, studying economics in college. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I went to Delhi University, studied at the Sriram College of Commerce, SRCC, as it is popularly known as. Um, And uh, I did economics and then followed it up with a degree in uh, law. Mm-hmm. Um, from also from Delhi University. Mm-hmm. I did a master's in uh, human resources, uh, you know, from XLRA Jamshedpur. Mm-hmm. Um, the degree itself was called uh, Personal Management and Industrial Relations when I did it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, since then I've been working in several different companies, mm-hmm. uh, you know, some in India, mostly in India. Um, I did a short stint for a couple of years in uh, Malaysia and when I had a mm-hmm. Asia Pacific responsibility, then went on to work in US for a couple of years mm-hmm. uh, with a, uh, you know, in a global responsibility in the company I was in. Mm-hmm. And they came back, um, you know, for the last couple of years I've been in uh, India. I came back and worked with PepsiCo, then mm-hmm. uh, Microsoft, Wipro, and now Last um, six years or so, I've been on my own. Wonderful, so. wonderful. So, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm probably older than you and I've been, I've often wondered, you know, when I started after, in 1979, after an MBA, uh, the human resources function was not called human resources. Yeah. There used to be an, a personnel manager, mm. there used to be an industrial relations manager. Mm. Over the years, it has evolved into the CHRO role. I'd love to get your perspective on the journey of this function from IR and personnel to a key C-suite executive role. Right, right. So if you um, sort of really look at, um, when you look at the role of human resources, Mm. effectively it is a way for uh, managing three dimensions. Mm -hmm. One is the way the work is done. Mm. And um, the way work is done means how much of automation are you going to do it largely in the factory? Is it a services thing? How much of um, you know, technology are you going to use? So that's the automation part of it. Mm. That in turn determines the kind of talent that uh, you will need. So, mm. you know, obviously, if you're going to work in shifts, you need shift supervisors. If you are going to you know, do work, which requires a lot of collaboration, it requires a different kind of a profile of people, some skills. Um, so that's the talent strategy. And the third element of that is uh, the workplace where uh, all this will happen. So this is the organization's policies, what kind of a talent brand and all that. Mm. So over a span of time, all three of them have changed. Mm. You know, so um, from a time when it was a lot about, as you said, uh, really creating policies and pretty much that was it uh, to a time when it was about, uh, you know, a bigger focus on law mm. and to talk about employment law, etc. Mm. Uh, over a span of time, as uh, you know, specifically, if you look at the way uh, we've started to look at the rise of technology as it shaped work, mm. the importance of the individual, uh, you know, the individual's contribution mm. has become far more important. So the mm. individual is no longer a replaceable uh, you know, factor of production. Correct. So then that is really where you start to look at talent management. Mm-hmm. Then you start to look at how do you make the workplace attractive? And uh, if you look at the last two years because of the pandemic, you are in a scenario where um, the workplace work and the worker, all three of them have been hugely defined, mm-hmm. redefined. Mm-hmm. So um, you will therefore see a sharp shift 
in the way this function uh, evolves over the next uh, two to three years. Mm -hmm. So you see that because all three has changed. Correct. Correct. So, uh, you know, I was, I've been speaking to several HR leaders. Uh, one was the, all the challenges that you have spoken about. And yet now with two years of the pandemic and work from home, the challenges seem to have uh, multiplied many fold. How are HR leaders managing this duality of work from home, partly in the, in, you know, uh, at work? And you know, there are lots of interesting uh, dynamics going on in organizations. So, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, the pandemic did was it shifted work from being done in a workplace kind of a setting. So you had a setting where home and work were two different places. Mm. Now, suddenly you sort of merge them together. Mm. So this necessarily will mean that, um, you know, the way uh, we will have to manage the workplace, the definition of the yep. workplace mm -hmm. is going to be very different. Mm. Now, if you start to manage the workplace with the same mindset as it used to be earlier, mm -hmm. um, then I think you get into a problem. There's resistance and it's uh, unfair. It's not inclusive. Mm -hmm. And there are challenges that individuals have faced. So, for example, when people uh, moved back and started working from home, a lot of that configuration changed. I don't think we paid a lot of attention to that. We just let people manage it on their own. Now, again, when we are looking to get people back into mm. a common place, we have to take into account that during these two years, mm. they've moved into a certain kind of a work setting. Mm. So, so I think when organizations are dealing with this work from home policy, mm -hmm. um, you know, they would have to actually go back and not just look at the workplace in isolation, but you have to look at you know, the way work will get done mm. and the talent pool that sort of um, works with it and then decide the workplace policies. Mm. So the sequence is always, you know, work, worker and workplace. Mm. Uh, and that's the sequence with which you need to design. If you start designing it at the end, you say, okay, everybody is saying, you know, work from home. Mm. So we will do it. Uh, you're probably going to uh, sort of uh, be more reactive than anything. Right. So the way to strategize it is to say, how will work get done? Mm -hmm. How much of this? And, and technology lets you do so many different things today. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the possibilities that you have to explore mm -hmm. as you are looking at it. In as much as, you know, when you look at the work, you will say, mm -hmm. uh, but there's a better technology to make whatever. Let's say mm -hmm. you imagine making cups and saucers. Then this is the way to sort of make that. Mm -hmm. You would take that into yeah. account in the same way for every organization, work, worker, and workplace is the sequence to look at things. Very interesting. And yet, uh, you know, when I've been reading about this thing called the great resignation, mm -hmm. you know, and I believe that impact is being seen in India as well. And it is being also being ascribed to the pandemic. I'd love to get your perspective on what is the great resignation and how is this going to impact companies as well as individuals? So I've written a fair bit about the great resignation and on my LinkedIn newsletter. Okay. Um, and, and one of the uh, ways to sort of understand is again, the framework that I said, work, worker, mm -hmm. workplace. When the, you know, so this is the first time when three things change simultaneously, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so work changed because there were some things which could not be done and some things which had opened up possibilities. For mm -hmm. example, uh, you know, earlier when I've done my recordings, it would be in a studio necessarily. But yep. today, you know, this technology al allows you and me to be in two different cities and yeah. uh, record. But at the same time, when you look at, um, uh, you know, the great resignation, it is a predominantly a shift of how the employee, the individual mm. is beginning to rethink their life in this new configuration. Mm which is that, you know, their personal equations have changed the kind of emotions that they experience today mm. um, because work is being done from home is different. And it is, you will therefore see the rise of emotions in the workplace, you know, so that's one shift. Therefore, people who can manage those relationships better, build that degree of trust, etc. Mm. Those are going to be the most successful people. So you are looking at a time when the great resignation is triggered either because of more fundamental reasons that mm -hmm. I feel that I'm not paid fairly. Mm -hmm. So that's one reason to shift mm -hmm. and people will very quickly make up and reach the fair wage mm -hmm. kind of a level. Mm -hmm. uh, the second piece is that, you know, this place offers me more flexibility 
flexibility can come in multiple ways. Work from home is not just the only thing, but it can be the time. You know, mm-hmm. can I? You know, some people are early birds. It's really like saying that if you start, um, you know, things at a certain kind of a time. Some people have a different sleep schedule. Now, the organizations have never worried about sleep schedule. Yeah. Are you feeling happy or sad about mm. you know, waking mm. up early? Mm. Those are factors that people can now exercise Correct. those choices. Correct. The, the third thing is that it opens up the platforms where I can start to look for work, not just in India, but outside in, uh, of India as well, because you know technology lets me do that. That opens up possibilities. Mm. And finally, the fourth big thing is uh, people are re- re-evaluating the priorities and say, mm. okay, you know, do I really want to uh, commute for four hours a day? And should I not spend the time, either maybe building a different skill, creating a different source of income, spending time with my kid, all these are possibilities uh, that people are grappling with. So I think this is a time when people are also reprioritizing what matters to them. In some cases, it's money. In some cases, it's the relationships. In some cases, it's the time. In some cases, it's creating opportunities for myself for future. So there are multiple reasons. It's not just one factor. Is, is it also uh, uh, partly because of the mindset that is changing if the younger leadership that is now coming into the corporate world, which are millennials and the Gen Zs? Or because people, had, when, when I was growing up four decades ago, uh, it was just work, work and work. I, I think um, uh, you're spot on, Ashutosh. I think, um, you know, the, the importance of work and the relationship with the employer uh, has undergone a very fundamental change. So it is not that significant because earlier our identity was all about work. You know, so it was that, you know, people would say, the first question they would say is, what do you do? Where do you work? And which is why when, um, you know, we would ask women, what do you do? Uh, and if uh, a lot of people say, I do nothing, even though they would work from home, you know, they would be managing the home, et cetera. We never valued that as a, an important enough thing to talk about. So um, this is a time when we are really looking at, um, you know, the priorities have changed. Mm. Work is no longer the be all and end all for a lot of people mm. because they have seen that when it comes to the crunch, while, you know, a lot of organizations would say, you know, you're like family, you're this, you're that. When it comes to the crunch, people would sort of take a very transactional view and say, well, we can't afford to yeah. uh, reduce our profits and they will yeah. lay off people. Mm. So this, this means that people are really rethinking that do you really care for me as much as you claim you do? Mm. And if the answer is no, you're all of my life. I have a life beyond that. That's and right. I'm the only one who cares about that. Mm. So I think um, mental well-being is becoming more important. We are also thinking about uh, experiencing new emotions in the workplace, like grief. Mm. We've never been able to address Correct. things like grief in the workplace. Yeah. How do you let people deal with that? And, you know, organizations are not designed to address those issues. Yeah, well said. So well-being has become such an important part of our lives, which didn't matter earlier so much. Mm. But, you know, there is so much of it that we have to resolve, address before we, you know, move further ahead. And what I'm also hearing you say is that proactive leaderships are actually taking into account factors like grief or even depression. At the work. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and, and this is so much that uh, individuals have undergone, you know, um, and grief um, as, a, as a feeling is not just what you experience when you lose a loved one. Absolutely. But grief, grief is what you experience when you are navigating an uncharted path. Correct. You know, you, are, uh, you don't have a map with which to navigate this particular experience. Mm. That causes grief, even though sometimes you're going from one place to a better place, Mm. uh, you can still experience grief. So I could move to a better job Mm. financially, but I could miss the people that I'm leaving behind or or the relationships or just the feeling of being valued. I'm losing that Mm. can be that when people give up their identity of any kind, Mm. it triggers grief. So I think those are some of the new things in the workplace. Very interesting. So let me switch gears a little bit and now ask you some different questions again relating to human beings. Um, and this is for all the, a lot of young people who will listen to our conversation. There is this often, often this debate, what is better? Staying in what used to be called when I joined ITC, a cradle to grave company or 
jumping jobs every two years because you're getting a b- bigger job and more money. Mm-hmm. I'd love your perspective. Okay, sure. Um, so I think uh, we are looking at um, uh, three different uh, kinds of uh, you know career mm-hmm. options. Um, I'll start with the first, which is the more traditional one, which you just mm-hmm. described. It's a cradle to grave model. Mm-hmm. You might change employers, but effectively you do the same thing. You are an engineer. You pretty much retire as Absolutely. an engineer. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. that's career 1.0. Mm-hmm. Career 2.0 is where uh, when you start your work, um, you kind of you know think about it like a fork. You mm-hmm. pivot and start to chase another dream, which could mm-hmm. be that I want to run my cafe. I want to be a musician. I want to be an artist. I want to be a writer. All those options, you know, people when they have done, and we know a number of examples of people who've done that really successfully. So you pivot, you ride two horses at the same time, and then at some point of time, Mm. you branch off into the second one, and that becomes something Mm. that you chase, and maybe even that changes at some time. Yeah. What we are now seeing is the beginning, early Mm. stages of uh, what I call career 3.0. Um, which is, uh, you know, where people monetize three or more skills. Mm -hmm. Um, And these three or more skills are, it is not multitasking. Mm -hmm. It's monetizing three different skills to create three different sources of income. So the visual for this kind of a career is, Mm -hmm. um, let's say it's more like a pizza slice where, you know, your your income is getting divided into three or more chunks. Mm -hmm. And some chunks are bigger because they contribute bulk of your income. Mm. Uh, so think about it as if you earned a hundred bucks from your salary, mm. this is the hundred rupees broken into three or more slices mm. um, and different skills make you go yep. through those. Mm. So that's where you are going to see mm. a lot more people, um, you know, going through that life. Very interesting. So let me ask, uh, change gears again, and let me now talk to you about technology. So, uh, you know, I'm going back again for decades and it was all compute, early computers, et cetera, et cetera. I want to get your perspective on how is technology changing human resources? Uh, you know, um, one sign that when technology uh, really starts to impact uh, a function or people or something, mm-hmm. the more it impacts, the less visible technology is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, so when you start to look at, um, you know, the kind of things that we do with our phone at one point of time, when you used your phone, it was something that everybody kind of, you know, it noticed and did mm-hmm. that. Okay. Um, but now, you know, sending an email from your phone has become passe. You can do that. You're surfing the net. You don't need to sit down. So it's become more invisible. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the same way, when you look at uh, uh, technology in HR, uh, whether it is video technology, which mm-hmm. is you are using it for hiring because, mm-hmm. you know, it helps you sort of hire in a certain way. It helps you screen your, uh, you know, uh, you don't need to have a human being screen and Mm. sort of apply their biased lenses. You can de-bias it by doing that. Mm. It sort of really shifts the distribution of work between, you know, things which are repetitive, Mm -hmm. things which are rule-based and things which are at scale Mm. are terrific candidates for technology to handle. Mm. Uh, Things which are exceptions to the rule are better done by uh, human beings. So mm. if you say that, um, uh, you know, this is something that applies to all employees mm. uh, and technology can track that and say, okay, this is an exception. This person has done this. Mm. But when you sort of say that, yes, it's an exception, but we should allow it. Mm. That's the human decision. So that's where it has shifted even in human resources. Uh, being able to, uh, you know, do some things which analyze data, et cetera, is better done by technology. It's just much better. That's it. Um, but let's say to now decide and say, uh, okay, for you, here is a different career path that I could recommend. Mm. It's something that, um, you know, the individual does much better. Well said. So I'm going to now come to the last segment of our conversation. And I want to talk to you a little bit about culture. Uh, I want to ask you, how do you, you define culture and then i'll come to my next question culture is the invisible code um, that tells people how to behave in a certain context mm. um, you know so you you have a certain kind of a cultural norm at home yep. uh, you know, whatever that might be and then you have a certain cultural norm in the office and your behavior is guided by those invisible norms um, and that's really the most powerful definition of culture that's 
you know, an amazing definition. I've heard so many, but this is a great definition. Uh, and my follow-up question to you, Abhijit, is that given the um, huge number of startups that are coming into the ecosystem now, what goes into building a strong culture for a startup and where does it start? Oh, what an awesome question. Um, so in my book, Dreamers and Unicorns, I talk about the fact that, um, uh, you know, and I'm defining dreamers as any of the startups, you have a product idea, you know what to do. Mm. That's a dreamer. What makes it grow into a, a unicorn, not just by financial valuation, but how does it grow as an organization? Mm. Um, what it means is the moment you cross the limit where you need more than one din large dining table to sit down and work together, mm. uh, you should be really beginning to start thinking about, um, you know, the kind of culture you want to create, right. which means that, you know, how, all those if then situations, mm. you know, your culture is therefore really like writing the algorithm for all the invisible things that will guide us. Correct. You know, Correct. How do we, how do we do things when somebody does not do that? You know, so for example, are we going to allow a certain kind of behavior in the office not? Mm. Um, and what happens if somebody does not follow it? Mm. Uh, does it mean termination? Does it mean a reprimand? Does it mean a recognition? And does it mean saying that, oh, we've never done this before, but that sounds like a good thing to incorporate. Mm. So it needs to be both. It cannot be, uh, you know, so watertight. It should not become a prison. Um, and, you know, this morning I was tweeting about... Um, uh, a lovely article I read in The Economist where it mm -hmm. talks about, you know, what's the difference between uh, a strong culture and a cult, mm -hmm. you know, that it, it does not allow for deviation of any kind. Mm -hmm. So there are certain kind of behaviors around that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, a strong culture in some sense makes people do a number of things without thinking about it. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a strong culture, each one is exercising their own judgment. You are spending a lot of time thinking about, is this the right thing? Mm. So for example, you know, um, in many schools, mm. when they say this is the uniform, it just mm. takes away one level of decision. Correct. Correct. So in some sense, the norms that you said should take away the really irrelevant decision-making points. Mm. In some case, what is irrelevant becomes important. So for example, should you impose a uniform at work mm. uh, is one kind of a thing, or should you say, no uniforms at work, but you have a dress code at work. So the nuance of that is really mm. the culture. Very interesting. So I'll give my last question to you, and I have to come to your book, uh, Dreamers and Unicorns. Tell me a little bit about your book and uh, what was your hypothesis and motivation to write it? So uh, Ashutosh, I wrote this book, uh, Dreamers and Unicorns, just as the pandemic started. I was mm. actually working on a different book around uh, organization, what makes organizations grow. Mm. And uh, so my big discovery was that, uh, you know, there are five forces. One is that the rise of intangible factors mm. like brand, leadership, talent and culture. These are the growth drivers, which is the subtitle of the book. Correct. The second thing that I noticed was that work workers in workplaces are going to become boundaryless. Mm. Uh, that, you know, it's not going to be defined by, you know, you look at cybercrime, for example, it's very hard to sort of figure out which law to apply because law is by country or a segment, but, you know, crime is boundaryless. Mm. Uh, so that, yeah. The third element is how do you sort of look at um, the leader's role is to balance polarities. Mm. Do you work with only full-timers? Do you work with freelancers? Mm. Do you work uh, focus on inside the organization? Mm. Do you work with people outside the organization, mm. the analysts, stakeholders? Mm. So that's the third polarity. The fourth is the rise of emotions in the workplace, which we mm. spoke mm. about. Uh, you know, trust becomes important. Grief mm. handling becomes important. Mm. And the fifth piece is that it's all going to be in perpetual beta. So, you know, it's saying that this is the new normal is actually a false consolation because it is never going to be the new normal. Mm -hmm. It will keep evolving. So you have to be able to be open to that evolution. This is what I wanted to talk about and why leadership, talent, and culture becomes 90% of your firm's growth pattern. How amazing. How amazing. Now, I'm going to certainly go out and look for your book on Amazon, and I'm going to encourage all our viewers and listeners to go and check it out. But Abhijit, on that note, uh, thank you so much for speaking to me. Thank you for talking to me about how the HR function has evolved. And, you know, it's almost like a journey that you took me through on, uh, you know, how it has grown into where it is today and how it is still evolving. Thank you for talking to me about the great resignation. I'm certainly going to go and look at LinkedIn and your postings on that on the great resignation. 
thank you for talking to me about culture and how culture is beginning to evolve. And finally, thank you for talking to me about your book. Thank you again and good luck. Thank you so much, Ashutosh. It's such a privilege to be able to talk to you and your audience. Thank I look forward to staying in touch. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience, and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website, www.tbcy.in, to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.